One of the most common jokes in the Monster Hunter fandom is that hunters are the real monsters. This can often come from just things like the brutality of speedruns, or constantly farming the monsters for parts. But in the actual canon of the game, it's also worth noting that some of the quest descriptions can be frivolous, greedy, or sometimes just downright cruel. These can sometimes seem to be catering to the whims of children or spoiled nobility. But at the same time, monsters are genuine hazards. Even small wyverns with little elemental ability can still pose a huge threat to villagers, and large elder dragons can wipe out towns just by accident, let alone by intention. Some quest descriptions are often pleased to save a village, and innocent people have occasionally been killed and consumed by monsters. So, is it right to hunt them or not? Most crucially, how may hunting affect monsters, both with impacts on their population, behaviour, ecology, and relationships with people? Is it justified protection, needless slaughter, or something more nuanced? And what role may the guild play in all of this? Let's do some analysis and find out. Let's start by establishing some terms. Quests were filed into 14 main categories based on their descriptions. The first was Major Human-Wildlife Conflict. This was a simple category and termed as any quest where a monster was confirmed or very heavily implied to have actually killed a human being. Next up was Minor Human-Wildlife Conflict. This was counted as any other form of genuine conflict between monsters and people. Injury, harassment, property damage, crop theft, and so on. It's worth stressing here that these things are only minor not because they're unimportant, but because I personally viewed human fatalities as a lot more significant and worth a category of their own. Minor human-wildlife conflict is still hugely important and worth taking serious action over. For small villages with little wealth, the loss of a wagon or a year's worth of crops can be a huge ordeal, potentially leaving you without food until the next harvest, or transport to acquire goods and medicine. It's very popular in Western news to portray taking action against such strife with animals as evil or shameful, as long as you don't live in the global north, in which case the animals become the villain, of course. And that's an issue all of its own. But it's an incredibly serious problem that poses a real threat to livelihoods. Next up was assumed human-wildlife conflict. These were quests where a nearby monster was assumed to be causing damage with its mere presence, but overall didn't really seem to be proven guilty of any of the suggested crimes. It's more assumed monsters must automatically be doing them. Then there is sport. This is any quest where a monster was killed for a hunter to prove themselves, either to a guild, village chief, or some other high ranker or official. This also included quests where a hunter was tasked to kill a monster another hunter had already tried and failed to kill. After this, we have food, any monster slain for human consumption. Research was termed as any monster slain for examination or use of their physical or chemical properties, or for scientific curiosity. Fear describes any quest where a monster wasn't necessarily doing anything, or was even suggested to be doing so, but its mere presence was causing stress and panic in the human population. Money is where any monster was slain purely for financial gain. Fashion is where any monster was slain for use of its hide or other integument for human apparel. Parts is similar, but describes any quest where a monster was slain for practical applications of its body parts or chemical abilities. Dislike describes any quest where monsters were seemingly killed just out of human spite towards them, and with no real proof of any conflict. Human Affairs describes any quest where a monster was killed to make way for human industry or military strategic movement or similar descriptions of human advancement. Finally, Other is any quest that didn't really fit these categories, and didn't really seem to have much reason. Monsters were classed in their canonical families, flying bird, pissing brute, snake, and fanged wyverns, along with fanged beasts, neopterans, crustaceans, amphibians, leviathans, and elder dragons. Finally, quests were taken from the ultimate editions of each game series. Freedom Unite was used for all the first and second gen quests. Three Ultimate for all the third gen ones. Four Ultimate and Generations Ultimate for all the fourth gen ones. And Iceborne and Rise for all the fifth gen ones. 
This only included hunting quests, so prowler, capture and arena quests were disqualified as well as quest descriptions reused for different hunting ranks. A total of 908 were categorised for this video. Now you see why it took so long. So with all that out of the way, what were our initial results? It's no surprise that flying wyverns were the most frequently hunted wyverns in most games, only beaten by bird wyverns in Generations Ultimate. Fanged beasts were third and elder dragons fourth. After this, there was a pretty steep decline in the frequency of monsters hunted. In terms of reasons for hunting, sport was the most common in first, second, third gen and also monster hunter rise. Research was the most common in Iceborne, and fear was the most common in both 4th gen games, and overall the single most frequent reason monsters were hunted across the series. Sport was second across the whole series, minor human wildlife conflict third, and research fourth. Monsters confirmed to have canonically killed people were mainly flying wyverns, and were regularly repeat offenders. Rathalos, Monoblos, Diablos, Gravios, and Nagakuga all had multiple kills confirmed. Cephadrome from the Pissing Wyverns and Ignacta from the Leviathans were also recorded to have killed people, as was Zenoga from the Fanged Wyverns. As a bit of general analysis right away, it's worth noting that a lot of the incidents of major human-wildlife conflict came from people actually trying to hunt the Wyverns and getting killed in the process. Flying Wyverns are the most numerous, widespread and diverse family in Monster Hunter, followed by Bird Wyverns so it's no surprise they took the top spots, as well as them being hunted from the first generation. So obviously there's going to be some selection bias in the processes here. Only beat by flying wyverns, bird wyverns are some of the most heavily hunted wyverns. They're hunted from the earliest point in the game, and most commonly for minor human-wildlife conflict. Their huge distribution as a family and very common abundance in most ecosystems mean they clash regularly with people over food and resources, as well as occasional conflicts. But is hunting the answer? And does hunting actually help? Quite probably not. It's fairly obvious that the raptorial bird wyverns are quite common to the point of being almost ever-present in most biomes, with regular attempts at culling them but even the larger volant bird wyverns are still very common too. Yan Kutku are described as very abundant with occasional population explosions, presumably linked to rainfall and neopteran numbers. And it's clear these animals often play bottom fiddle to larger predatory animals. Dromes and greats are fairly regularly killed by other wyverns, either for food or out of competition or both. And there are considerable implications that the larger bird wyverns suffer predation too. Kutku is occasionally killed by its larger cousin Garuga, and Kutku scales can be found in the dung of Rathalos and Rathian nests. Gypsaros is a favourite food of Nursilla, and other bird wyverns can fare poorly in turf wars against large predators. Smaller carnivores that are used to high rates of predation can often handle it very well at a population level, and so from this can often handle human-caused mortality reasonably well too. Studies of black-backed jackals comparing the two show that humans and natural predators have pretty similar impacts on jackal survival. They're also occasionally hit by disease epidemics like rabies, but can bounce back from these well too. So jackals are used to high rates of mortality no matter what the source, and naturally have high rates of reproduction, but can also alter their reproductive biology accordingly with the cause of mortality. When you kill the resident dominant pair of adult jackals, younger individuals that normally wouldn't be breeding now come into these empty territories. They start breeding earlier, and have more pups to fill in the gaps left by the mature killed individuals. This adaptation to such high rates of natural predation, as well as disease cycles, can be seen in other similar carnivores too. With some studies of coyotes, it's estimated up to a third of adults can be removed annually by predation, but with no drop in overall numbers. And this seems reasonable to suggest for bird wyverns too. Kutku are said to occasionally have huge booms in population, which despite mortality suggests that they're principally controlled by bottom-up factors like food and rainfall, over top-down factors like predation or competition. It also suggests very high levels of reproduction that so many of them can be produced in a short space of time. Despite high levels of hunting by both man and predators, 
Raptorial bird wyverns are still very present in ecosystems, and likely have very rapid reproductive capabilities too. As with jackals, constant human hunting probably results in greater numbers of animals coming into human areas. Rather than a stable pack of jaggy or velociprey controlling a set territory, it results in a conveyor belt of young animals coming into human areas to breed at a younger age and have larger litters, resulting in a larger problem for the villagers than if they'd just left the stable group of mature adults. So clearly, human hunting isn't going to render bird wyverns extinct at least. But does that mean that it's necessarily the right thing to do? Quite probably not. For one thing, it isn't necessarily a good call to start hunting things just because they're common. They can be hunted, but this is hardly a reasonable justification. For another, the killing possibly results in more animals breeding that increases the likelihood of human-wildlife conflict. Non-lethal methods actually show more success than lethal ones when it comes to predator control. Predator deterrence to jackals, like protective collars on livestock or livestock guardian animals, show both equal or greater success and greater economic savings than lethal predator control. And these costs are worth noting. On one hand, the monster is presumably taken care of for free for the village. But there's nothing to suggest the guild actually compensate villagers. It's all very well and good getting rid of the Rathian that smashed your cart, or the Roggy Pack that ate your cattle. But what about actually paying for the damages that these not especially wealthy areas will incur? It's unknown how payment and all works with the guild, but it seems that villagers should want an option that prevents the initial damages and thus the costs to them. And it does seem that the guild typically use bird wyverns to break in newer hunters to get them started. But this may be a reason why there's so much human-wildlife conflict. But what about the larger predatory monsters too? Your large predatory wyverns and fanged beasts? They may suffer similar problems related to dispersal. Puma are hunted for a variety of reasons, but most commonly wildlife control and recreation. But data suggests that intensive hunting may actually increase human-wildlife conflict, especially for males. Like with jackals, when you kill the resident animal in an area, this leaves a vacuum that younger dispersing animals come to fill. Instead of one mature animal, now you get several younger ones. Whilst these individuals don't have the similar reproductive abilities to animals like jackals, to create a rapid population increase, as much larger and more dangerous animals they don't have to to make themselves a hazard. Just the fact that there are now more animals in the area therefore increases the probability of negative encounters. And the fact that these are younger animals also exacerbates this a lot. They're likely less skilled at hunting wild prey, and so are more likely to go for livestock. They're less experienced overall, and so are less likely to avoid or ignore human areas. Instead of one not very troublesome animal, you now have several ones far more likely to cause problems. Unlike with jackals, this also isn't a problem replicated by any natural mortality, as healthy adults are typically the age class with the lowest mortality in large carnivores. This is one thing for puma, and quite another for large monsters. We know a lot of large flying wyverns and most of the monsters are pretty fiercely territorial, and don't tolerate other males of their own kind in their territories. Killing a resident Rathalos, Blangonga, or Anjanath likely results in more youngsters coming in and creating far greater problems. We can almost see this in some quest structures. When you killed the Tigrex that live near Poke in Freedom 2, you then had to do the Land of Tremors quest and kill two at once. It's worth noting here that Fear, followed by Sport, are the most common quest types for this type of wyvern, and likely with bird wyverns results in a conveyor belt of problems. The resident animal is killed for sport, young animals come in and create human-wildlife conflict, and this creates a culture of fear that results in more killing and conflict overall. Considering flying wyverns are also the type that are responsible for most human mortalities, it's no wonder that fear prevails as well. They are massive, powerful, and hazardous animals capable of destroying buildings, eating large numbers of livestock, and killing multiple people. Their management and interactions with people have to be taken seriously, and yet the lethal control the guild keeps using likely only makes this conflict more frequent. On top of this, the frequency of hunting may actually result in more hostile monsters. One study of elephants showed their responses to indigenous communities they lived with, 
Maasai men will spear elephants to prove masculinity, and traditionally wear noticeable red garments, as well as having different diets and ablutions to the Kamba people, who are pastoralists who don't really interact negatively with elephants. Elephants react fearfully to the scent and with aggression to the garments of the Maasai, even individuals that haven't been hunted before. So regardless of the demographic, hunted animals may ultimately become more aggressive to people who hunt them. And this is pretty damning for the villagers once again. Hunters who aggravate these animals are at very least well equipped to deal with such threats. But the same villagers who have to gather their resources in the same environments may well pay the price of having such hostile monsters as neighbours. The same study showed that elephants weren't as hostile to the Kamba people who they had little negative interactions with, but this may not apply in the monster hunter world. The diversity of armour, apparel, appearances and other things that affect scent and appearance likely mean that monsters have no choice but to classify every human as hostile. Hunters also use the same carts and skiffs for transport as everyday people, so monsters may link those two and attack anything related to human presence. This is noteworthy as it shows how it affects monsters that aren't carnivores. It's natural to expect predators to be in conflict with people, especially people with livestock. But this shows how animals that aren't necessarily an initial threat can become one through human actions. Bird wyverns, herbivores like bloss wyverns and durambaros, as well as elder dragons, may not necessarily be innately human aggressive, but have become so due to sport hunting. Considering these are among the most powerful monsters, with incredible elemental abilities, and awesome feats of strength, this may be a pretty serious management issue. It's one thing when this is raptorial bird wyverns, and quite another when this extends to giant wyverns and elder dragons. Populations of animals in the New World do seem to show that less heavily hunted animals are okay around people, and it's the panicky Old World populations that are responsible for much of the actual conflict. After all, most quests in Worldborn are for research and not problem animals. I also think it's really worth noting too that despite their lethal reputation, Elder Dragons very rarely kill people or cause actual damages. They're killed most commonly for fear, research, and sport in that order. Other quests like actual conflict barely make a dent in comparison. So the fact that excessive hunting may create aggressive, people-hostile animals is important, as the emotional responses people have to animals are incredibly important for their conservation. Smaller, less dangerous, and less troublesome carnivores are very often accepted much more than the bigger, riskier ones which is fairly easy to understand. But cultures can also impact this too. People protect what they love, and a number of species are often protected by the indigenous cultures who view them as important. Responses of people and their acceptance of non-lethal management to hazardous animals can often be predicted much better by their emotions towards them, rather than the damages they can or do cause. Rather than shoring up goodwill with education and less killing, the guild instead seem to have a one-size-fits-all policy of killing everything that misbehaves. Education may be incredibly important, as changes in the natural world can create fearful environments for people. In For You, fear is the most common quest reason, and it's also the game with the frenzy virus. It's no real wonder people were terrified and demanding monsters to be slain left, right, and center when they were literally inflicted with dragon rabies and were hugely aggressive, with no information on what to do or how to spot the symptoms or anything, demanding the guild kill the monster is their only real option. There are already some small snippets of what people think of monsters in the franchise. Kutku can be viewed as bringing good luck, elder dragons are occasionally viewed as gods, and everyone hates Devil Joe. This may be partially earned though, as fatal incidences can have long-lasting ripples that can seriously wound the public perception of an animal. Shark attacks are perhaps the best example of this. Despite their very low frequency and low fatalities, the media response and public perception is incredibly disproportionate to this. It's likely similar with monster attacks. All it takes is one serious attack for a species to be viewed as unstoppable killing machines. They become convinced they're all death monsters, and don't really want to take the risk of having them around when they're so certain of their danger. As said, fear is often born from ignorance or misinformation, and when people don't know a lot about the hazardous wildlife they live with, 
they can often make worse, fearful assumptions about it. A calm elder dragon ignoring people, or one that provides a fleeting glimpse as it leaves, can establish trust and excitement in local communities that will provide a lot of goodwill. A panicked, wounded elder dragon pursued by hunters that raises a village to the ground may turn an entire nation against its whole species for decades to come. Hunters may also make things worse by directly creating problem animals themselves. It's worth noting a lot of the sport quests are someone asking you to finish off an aggravated monster that they already attacked, and this recklessness that is seemingly endorsed by the guild seems like it can create huge problems. As well as more aggressive animals overall, it can also directly create the problem animals that are huge threats. Wounded animals that actively create human-wildlife conflict. Deadeye Yangaruga is said to be very people-aggressive due to so many attempts to hunt it that it survived. People want to kill Crystal Beard Yoragan and the guild let them. Bloodbath Diablos was almost certainly created by endless past attempts to hunt it, resulting in it becoming a true monster. It literally also says Dread King Rathalos ignores people, yet the guild still offer it up as a quest to those qualified to take it on, not because it actually does anything. Anecdotally, many man-eating tigers and leopards in India were very often created by unskilled hunters wounding an animal and then leaving it, as was the case of a very aggressive elephant with a bullet lodged in its tusk. Some of the most dangerous individuals of monsters were seemingly only created by people trying to kill them, literally creating much worse problems due to their obsession with hunting. But it's worth asking, what's the alternative? Earlier, it was mentioned that non-lethal methods can be better than just killing predators, but this is also very hard to implement against giant wyverns. A set of steel spikes to blanket Aptonoth won't save them from Rathalos that learn to just use fire, or a Tigrex that learns to dismantle this. The size, power, and abilities of wyverns and other monsters make them very difficult to come up with working management solutions based off real-world ones. There are some methods, though, Cattle and other livestock canonically exist in Monster Hunter, and swapping to these animals over Aptonoth may limit predation for large monsters. Bird wyverns may still pose a threat, but it's far easier to protect against Velocidrome than Rathalos. The guild could also use their considerable wealth to directly compensate people who have losses from monsters, especially if they live near active hunting concessions. There can also be ways to work around wyverns, much like real life, a lot of conflict comes from when people need to gather materials out of settlements. Having hunters guard villagers in the process can potentially reduce initial conflict. Or similarly, hazing monsters as people do nowadays with bears to make them leave human areas could also work. It is worth noting monsters up to elder dragons do try and flee areas when attacked, often to just be pursued endlessly by the hunters. If the hunter just backed off after making their initial point, it's quite possible the hunter may just avoid people from then on. So with all that, is monster hunting needed? Should the franchise take itself seriously to the full extent and just become Monster Hunter Snap or Moga Geographic? Of course not. There will always be a need for monster hunters, just as some problem animals can in some cases only be dealt with via their destruction. Man-eating lions in Africa can be caused by a myriad of reasons, but one of them is from hunting porcupines and getting infected wounds in the limbs or jaws as a result. This in turn creates a problem animal unable to hunt natural prey that takes to stock killing or man-eating. Similarly, older animals can also become a problem. Elderly carnivores can sometimes take to stock killing if driven out but not killed by a rival. But older animals in general can also take more risky and aggressive behaviours as they have less to lose than younger conspecifics they're much more likely to go all in and become more of a threat. The key point is that dangerous problem animals that can't really be treated or relocated for fear of repeat behaviour can exist naturally, and this can easily occur in Monster Hunter too. An Anjanath with a mouthful of separating quills from attacking Toby Kodachi, a Rathalos with a torn wing from a fight with a rival, Devil Joe suffering from the savage mutation, Tigrex that breaks its foot after a bad landing, these animals lead tough lives, and a crippling injury that leads to one becoming a man-eater or similar hazard isn't that hard to imagine at all. There will always be a need for monster hunters, but to actually deal with problem animals, 
not in the current organisation of the guild with its obsession with sport hunting. Something to consider too is that the human civilization in the Monster Hunter world is growing. What started as purely medieval or Tudorish settlements in 1st gen have grown to include proper steam engines by 5th gen. This is a world on the cusp of an industrial revolution, and the chaos that will follow. The first ever Diablos quest describes it destroying a border wall. In Generations Ultimate, it mentions that this is now a regular problem. Monsters need huge areas of space and don't like being penned in. Expanding human populations and the infrastructure to support them will slice apart the huge habitats needed for large monsters, just as it has for our own planet's wildlife. One of the most repeated quests in 4th gen is the need to kill monsters blocking or disrupting trade routes. Larger, hungrier populations of people with big resource needs will be less tolerant, and if monsters get labelled as problems just like our native wildlife did following industrial revolutions in our own world, dozens of species may not have long left. The guild's gung-ho, kill-first and ask-questions-later attitude likely causes monster behaviour to change, and in turn causes increases in human-wildlife conflict that in turn causes fear in human populations that demand more hunting. It's a cycle of killing where no one but the pockets of the guild really win. It may not be that this is deliberate, and the guild may be ignorant over flat-out malicious, but also the guild don't seem to be very well connected, respected, or even liked by some areas. No one listens in Moga when they're told to evacuate their homes by them, and Poke is actually outside of guild jurisdiction, showing that in some areas they just really don't care about it if they're too remote. This doesn't seem like the actions of a genuinely charitable organisation doing everything it can to keep balance. Similarly, the guild clearly liaises with the nobility a lot, and from the apparel of high-ranking officials and the scale of expeditions to the New World, it's clear that they're incredibly well-funded. It could be the guild may have become the wealthy elite's pest control club at the cost of poor villages. In terms of meta-commentary, I don't feel these conclusions are bad ones. Capcom very obviously want a Monster Hunter game with a good, strong narrative, but aren't especially good at writing one. People say, rightly, that For You has the best story, but even then this is more the best of a bad bunch. There are possible conclusions that the actions of the guild and hunters could create the problem can lead to a good story for sure as well as some actual arcs for characters when they start to question, is hunting monsters right? There are a lot of fan theories about the dodginess of the guild, so we'll just have to wait and see if anything will actually come from this. It's also Capcom. I imagine they'll still be making Monster Hunter to the point where you'll be fighting Mecha Rathalos in space, before they canonically admit the guild is bad or a monster could be officially extinct, but who knows. This script also made me realise how much I want to see more of the human civilizations in the world of Monster Hunter, and what they think of monsters. Heraldry, myth, culture, tradition, and folklore are all steeped with animals in our world, and it's impossible to believe the world of Monster Hunter isn't also saturated with similar beliefs, and similar legends and symbols too. We know nothing of this in Monster Hunter. And so an exploration of this and what different monsters could mean to different cultures and the impacts of hunting or guild interference also seems like a ripe fruit to pick to me. Thanks for watching. This video took some time to make, partially just because I'm very busy of late, but also due to the amounts of data that had to be crunched for it. So thanks to IOAS for helping with the third gen quests especially. There's a lot of subjectivity here. You may well disagree with some of the categories I put quests in, or done things differently yourself. But in broad strokes, this was as accurate as I could get it. There's already room for further analysis I can think of, and this video changed quite a bit in the course of making, as they often do. So it's possible with future games this topic may be revisited as well. I'm glad a lot of people enjoyed the last video. And whilst quite a few disagreed on some aspects like the accuracy or worth of Chase by Dinosaurs, that's all fair enough, and it was effectively just a giant opinion piece. There was definitely the elephant in the room of Prehistoric Planet, and so to give my thoughts on it this early on, I do think it looks very promising. The effects look incredible, Sir David Attenborough's narration is always very welcome, and no doubt Jon Favreau consumed a lot of nature documentaries writing it. All in all, it looks like something it'll be well worth getting a free trial of Apple TV for to watch. I'm unsure if it'll beat Walking With in all aspects though, 
I'm unsure who's doing the score and if they'll beat Bartlett, not bloody likely, but still. The focus on the Cretaceous only is also something that's not ideal, but considering you can't just have 20 episodes for each decent formation, actually picking the dinosaurs in question will be difficult. So overall, I'm looking forward to it for sure. Thanks to everyone who watches, likes, subscribes, and shares with others too. I'm genuinely astonished I've gone well past 15k at this point, a goal I never set as I never thought I'd reach it. So thank you to everyone who supported me thus far. Next time there will be a video on monster design, so I imagine I'll lose some of you pretty quickly for my pure treason. But either way, see you then. And for those of you asking why Walking with Caveman wasn't included in the walking video, well, I, um, it, um...